um, presenter this afternoon is Dr. Brad Wilcox. Dr. Wilcox is a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. He's held research fellowships at Princeton, Yale, and the Brookings Institute. He's a prolific writer and researcher, director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia, and a senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies. Please welcome Dr. Bradford Wilcox. So I'm here today to speak about gender and parenthood in America. Indeed, I've actually helped to write the book on gender and parenthood, as you can see here with my colleague, <laughs> Kathy Kupfer Klein. But I want to begin on, on a bit of a more serious note by talking about three different social facts in America today. You know, we know that there's been a kind of tremendous family revolution over the last half century um, in America. What that means really is three important things. One, today marriage is much less likely to ground adulthood and to guide the bearing and rearing of children. Two, today about one in two children will spend some time living apart from their biological father, that is growing up over the course of their childhood years. And then third, today, poor and working class kids are nearly twice as likely to experience family instability as our upper middle class kids. So it's a real kind of class dynamic, which often I think lose sight of in these family discussions. That is that all the changes that we're talking about you know, today, and particularly the sort of the rise of fatherlessness, is much more likely to be affecting kids um, in poor working class communities. To put this in simpler terms, our nation's retreat from marriage means that the least of these are especially likely today to grow up in a home without their own mother or especially uh, their own father. Now, in considering the changing character of American family life, there are certainly some sectors of the culture who don't think that it's of much concern that kids are now much less likely to grow up in a home, for instance, without their father. From Hollywood to the halls of academia, we often hear the message that it doesn't matter that so many kids are being raised without their fathers. So Jennifer Aniston has said, for instance, quote, women are realizing it more and more, you know, that they don't have to settle with a man just to have that child. Or the Cornell psychologist Peggy Drexler said, quote, women possess innate mom power that in itself is more than sufficient to raise fine sons. Well, the psychologists Louis, Louise Silverstein and Carl Auerbach have said, quote, neither mothers nor fathers are essential to child development, and responsible fathering can occur within a variety of family structures. This is kind of the view we often get, again, in certain precincts, certain sectors of our culture today. So then one, I think, problem with this kind of new view, this new sense of what's happening in the family, and that is it's, I don't think it's, it's true. <laughs> and in fact, I think the biological and social sciences would suggest to us that number one, fathers tend to parent somewhat differently than do mothers. Two, that kids tend to benefit uh, from having an engaged father and an engaged mother. And three, that kids from poor and working class communities, again, are paying a particularly heavy price today for our nation's retreat uh, from marriage. Now, as I kind of make this argument today in public, I want to be very clear that I think, number one, there are obviously exceptions here. Um, and the things I'm saying about mothers and fathers, we know that, of course, that there are mothers who are extremely firm. And we know that there are fathers um, who are more nurturing than the mother is in their home. So again, there are exceptions here. That's an important uh, first caveat. And the second big caveat comes from Ross Park, psychologist at the University of California. He'll be mentioned a couple of times today. And he makes the basic point that both parents, of course, are capable of giving kids what they need when it comes to nurture and affection, feedings, mm -hmm. and other things that are important for appropriate development. Okay. So again, both parents can give kids what they need kind of fundamentally. Those are, I think, the two important caveats that I want to mention here in my remarks uh, today. But having said that, I also think that it's, it is the case that on average, 
Um, dads bring some distinctive gifts to the parenting enterprise, some distinctive talents to the parenting enterprise. And I'm going to touch on um, four of those gifts uh, today in, in talking about uh, moms and dads. And again, as I return to Ross Park again and thinking about these questions, he makes, he makes this point about moms and dads. He says, quote, Evans suggests that these differing styles of maternal and paternal interaction, they provide unique opportunities to learn different kinds of skills that are important for children's intellectual and social comments. So again, guys, think about the unique talents that moms and dads have when it comes to parenting. They're helpful for developing different talents in the part of uh, their children. So these talents for dads revolve around providing, discipline, play, and challenging their children. I think they're rooted both in nurture, in particular cultural and social structural configurations, but also I think have some kind of connection to, to nature as well. So first, let's talk about providership. You know, we often can, I think, forget this sometimes, talking about parenthood, but, but it is the case, it is the case that money matters. You know, money matters when it comes to food, when it comes to clothing, when it comes to housing, when it comes to education. You have a kid playing soccer, up here maybe hockey. You know, these things take money. You need a tutor for your child. You know, these things take money. Um, when it comes to housing, obviously, these things take money. And it's still the case that today in America, even though a lot has changed, obviously, when it comes to sort of gender and breadwinning and everything else, it still is the case that kind of in the average home, um, dads are more likely to take the lead when it comes to breadwinning. So today, about 69% of the family income comes from, uh, from fathers in married homes across the U.S. It's also the case, too, when you look at kind of patterns of who's a full-time stay-at-home, we can see, as the slide here indicates, it's much more the case that women are doing that um, compared to men. So again, kind of in the average home, men are more likely to be taking lead when it comes to providing. They're also more likely to express um, a kind of a preference working full time, um, even when money um, is kind of not an obstacle or not a consideration, as a recent poll from the New York Times um, suggested back in, in 2013. So the point here is that clearly fathers make a real material contribution to the welfare of their families, one that we should not forget and we should not minimize. A second point is that when it comes to kind of discipline, and it's important here, of course, to recognize that in the average home with a mother and a father, it's actually moms who do more disciplining than do dads, in part because they spend more time with, with kids, generally speaking. But dads tend to have a distinctive approach to discipline. Um, they tend to engender a bit more fear um, in their kids' lives because of their comparative physical strength and size, along with pitch and inflection of their voice. <laughs> you know, these things telegraph toughness to kids. Um, compared to moms, dads are a bit more assertive and they're less willing to bend the rules um, than moms are. Now it's important again to sort of think about this through the lens of complementary um, approaches. As the Yale psychiatrist Kyle Pruitt has said, quote, fathers tend to be more willing than mothers to confront their children and enforce discipline, leaving their children with the impression that they in fact have more authority. But he and his wife go on to note that the distinctive approaches to discipline that moms and dads have benefit kids because moms are much more likely to kind of adjust their approach to discipline to the child's particular situation and circumstance. And of course, there are times when that approach is much more <laughs> prudent than a father's approach. But it's also the case, too, that when kids have the exposure to kind of a maternal style of discipline and a paternal style of discipline, they're learning kind of different skills about how the world works and how it might work, for instance, perhaps say in the military versus a college campus, say, like St. Thomas. So again, the point here is that moms and dads tend to approach discipline in somewhat different ways, and both of these different approaches are valuable, often in the situation uh, for the child, but also in terms of helping prepare the child for a future um, in the adult world. third point is about play. And here I think dads have an advantage when it comes to play. 
Although mothers, once again, spend more time playing with their kids um, in some kinds of activities, particularly indoors, dads are much more likely to engage their infants, their toddlers, and their teens in vigorous, physical, and exciting forms of playing games. Of course, this picture here gives you a sense of what dads will often do you know, in the pool <laughs> or on the playground in ways that can kind of make mom's eyes roll or kind of you know, look back at, at what dads are doing. And this vigorous style of play is not inconsequential. We kind of tend to sort of not think about it or minimize it or whatever else, but actually it's been found to promote social skills, intellectual development, and a sense of self-control. Engaging in rough physical play, for instance, with a father teaches kids how to deal with aggressive impulses and physical contact without losing control of their emotions. For instance, one study found that father-child play taught children to recognize others' emotions and to regulate their own emotions. As Emory psychologist John Sneary wrote, quote, children who roughhouse with their fathers quickly learn that biting, kicking, and other forms of physical violence are not acceptable. So, you know, you can imagine that Thursday evening, it's getting close to bedtime, and, you know, dad is taking the four-year-old and wrestling, tickling, you know, the child on the, you know, on the family room floor, and mom is getting impatient. You can understand that impatience. But my point here tonight is that that kind of thing is actually quite important for the long-term welfare um, of that. Because we actually even find in studies that kids who play more often with their dads in these kind of roughhousing ways are more popular in their classes at school. So the point here is the kind of physical, arousing, engaging play that dads have with their kids gives kids lessons um, that prepare them well for the game of life. The fourth point, dads um, and challenges. You know, dads play a central role in pushing their kids to face the challenges and opportunities that confront them outside the home. Compared to moms, dads are more likely to engage and encourage their kids to take up difficult tasks, to seek out novel experiences, and to endure pain and hardship without yielding. At a young age, fathers are more likely than mothers to encourage toddlers to engage in novel activities, to interact with strangers, and to be independent. As children enter adolescence, fathers are more likely to introduce children to the worlds of work, sports, and civil society. The bottom line here is that fathers excel in teaching their kids the virtues of fortitude and temperance and prudence as they prepare for life outside of the family. Or in the words of like psychologist Daniel Paquette, quote, fathers play a particularly important role in the development of children's openness to the world. They also tend to encourage children to take risks, thus permitting children to learn to be braver in unfamiliar situations as well as to stand up for themselves. He talks about, for instance, an ex you know, a, um, a study uh, looking at French parents who were taking their toddlers to learn how to swim. And what this study revealed is that moms, you know, kind of in the water, were more likely to hold their child face to face, okay, to give their child that security in, in deep water, so to speak. By contrast, Dads are much more likely to turn the child around, okay, and to send that child, you know, Duke and Altum, out into the deep, if you will. Uh, <laughs> not literally, of course, but I'm saying they were turning the child around, having the child kind of see the water, you know. Um, on them. This is kind of an example of the way in which fathers are more likely, again, to prepare their kids for, uh, for the outside world. Of course, and we'll talk about this in a second, there's considerable evidence that this kind of engagement helps both boys and girls engage the outside world, both in the playing fields, literally, um, and the playing fields of life. So we kind of think about how having an engaged father might be important for kids. It's worth kind of looking at just a couple of outcomes to kind of give you a taste of this. Also, let me be very clear here. I was raised myself by a single mom. I didn't have a father in the home growing up from age you know, three on. And I want to be clear here, what I'm suggesting today is that not that every child who doesn't have, say, a father in the home is going to be floundering. It's just that kids who have a father in the home, um, a mother and father in the home, are more likely to be flourishing. That's an important kind of you know, caveat to these things. So we know 
that boys who don't have an engaged father, by contrast, um, are less likely to be kind of developing a healthy sense of masculinity. They're more likely to develop a kind of compensatory masculinity. They're trying to sort of assert themselves um, in ways that are, you know, more problematic. Um, we see here when it comes to delinquency, for instance, that boys who score the top third in the quality of the relationship with their father were much more likely to be delinquent compared to boys who had both a poor quality relationship with that in pink and boys who are growing up in a home uh, without their father. So kind of this gives you a sense of how having a father in the home helps boys kind of navigate adolescence um, and challenges perhaps with, uh, with the law, for instance. But dads matter for daughters as well. What we see in the research is that um, when girls don't have the attention and the affection of a father, um, when they don't have a dad kind of monitoring who's coming into the household, um, they're more likely to succumb to the intentions of uh, teenage boys or young men who don't have their best interests at heart. So we see, for instance, that teen pregnancy is much more common among girls who have a poor quality relationship with their father there in pink or who are living in a home without their father, that's in green, compared to girls who have a high quality relationship with their father um, there in yellow. So in a very real way here, um, high quality dads, dads who are engaged and are affectionate with their daughters, are helping to protect them from you know, one of the obstacles um, that can crop up, uh, particularly for teenage girls. And for both boys and for girls, we see that um, teenagers who have engaged fathers, affectionate dads, are more likely to be flourishing psychologically. You can see again that kids in that high quality bar in yellow have low levels of depression. By contrast, kids in that, that pink and green a set of bars are more likely to be, uh, to be floundering on the emotional front. And I also made the point too just about kind of the way in which these, pen, these parenting dynamics are playing out um, in a kind of a stratified way, affecting poor working class kids uh, more than upper middle class kids. And so one indicator of this, or actually really sort of a complex of indicators around this, is sort of in the educational arena. And we're seeing here from the work of David Autor and Melanie Wasserman at MIT is that more and more low-income kids are growing up in homes without their fathers. And what's, I think, particularly concerning in this, as their quote suggests, is that a kind of a vicious cycle can begin to develop. Well, particularly low-income boys are floundering in school and then the labor force and then don't really make as sort of attractive sort of husbands, fathers, or, or just mates in general uh, because of what's happening um, in their households. So we see, for instance, in Otter's work that absences are particularly high for lower income boys compared to others um, in, their, uh, in their communities when they're growing up without their father. And these same kinds of patterns apply also to things like being suspended in school, uh, dropping out of high school, um, even kind of performance in the labor force as in adults. So again, the point I'm making here is that particularly on the educational and the labor force fronts, it looks like boys growing up in poor working class homes are paying a particularly big price for this retreat from marriage uh, that we're seeing in the United States. Okay, let me turn now to moms. And I want to suggest four ways again that moms have particular uh, distinctive talents when it comes to the bearing and rearing of children. And again, I think that these talents are rooted both in nurture, in particular cultural and social structural configurations, but also um, in nature oftentimes as well. So let's just take uh, breastfeeding. Obviously only moms can breastfeed their children. And of course breastfeeding is a time-consuming in our contemporary world, often inconvenient thing. But most mothers find breastfeeding physically pleasurable and emotionally rewarding. There are also clear health benefits for mothers who breastfeed, which is a marked reduction in the risk of breast cancer for women. And it's also important to note that the medical literature on the advantages of breastfeeding could not be clearer. Breast milk offers infants a range of sugars, nutrients, and antibodies that are not available in infant formula. Breastfeeding seems to protect infants against at least 
10 serious maladies, from ear infections to sudden infant death syndrome, or, or SIDS. It also helps to cement the biological foundations of a unique mother-child bond that tends, for many, to last into um, and beyond adolescence. So clearly, I think it's the case that mothers have a very distinct advantage in parenting uh, when it comes uh, to breastfeeding. And when it comes to parenting, mothers, I think, also build on this biological foundation oftentimes to excel in interpreting the physical cues of their kids. Mothers are more responsive to the distinctive cries of infants. They're better able than dads, for instance, to distinguish between a cry of hunger and a cry of pain from their baby. They're also better than fathers at detecting the emotions of their children by looking at their faces, postures, and gestures. One experiment found, for instance, that women are better than men at identifying infant emotions such as sadness, fear, surprise, or joy. I noticed you funny that teenagers reported that their mothers knew them better and are more in tune with their moods than their fathers were. Dr. Marion Legato, who directs the Partnership for Gender-Specific Medicine at Columbia University, believes that biology has primed women to read the nonverbal cues of infants. She writes, quote, women have to be better at reading the subtle and nuanced language of human expression compared to men so they can better determine the needs of their highly dependent wordless infants, unquote. And as kids age into adolescence, moms tend to retain this advantage. Moms also have an advantage when it comes to communicating with their kids. They use more words. They use more descriptive words with their kids. They can interpret the tone and content of their children's utterances better than men. And they actually remember what their children actually said better than fathers do. <laughs> this is all from Dr. Marian Legato again from Columbia. And actually, she also makes the point, this probably also will resonate with many people here, this advantage applies not just to parenting, but also to marriage, okay? <laughs> so think about these words, not just for parenting again, but also for, for marriage. I can attest personally, my wife can run circles around me when it comes to this kind of communication. So why is this? Well, obviously there are lots of reasons why this is the case, but Dr. Legato suggests that part of the story here, part of the story here is biological. She notes that first, women have more nerve cells than left brain, which is the seat of our ability to process language. Secondly, women's left and right brains enjoy more connectivity than do men's. That is, the corpus callosum, the network of fibers connecting the left and right brains, is larger in women's brains than in men's brains. Third, women also have more dopamine in the part of the brain responsible for language and memory skills. Dopamine, of course, is a chemical messenger that helps to deliver information efficiently within the brain. So as Dr. Legato says, quote, the increased accessibility of these biological systems makes listening to, understanding, and producing speech easier for women. This paternal sensitivity to kids, I think, helps explain why mothers tend to excel when it comes to nurturing their young, especially infants and toddlers. Because they're better able to read their kids, they're better able to provide their kids with what they need, from a snack to a hug, when there's some type of distress. Perhaps more importantly, there is considerable sociological and psychological evidence to suggest that mothers are more emotionally attached to their kids than their fathers. So the point here is that mothers seem to be more invested emotionally in responding to their kids um, compared to fathers. Why is this? Well, Dr. Legato again suggests that part of the reason here is biological. Sorry, I'm going here. She says that mothers are primed by their hormones to engage more in nurturing behavior, such as hugging, praising, or cuddling. Women have, for instance, higher levels of estrogen than men. And estrogen is known to promote nurturing behavior. The hormone oxytocin, which is released at high levels by women during pregnancy and breastfeeding, also makes moms more interested in bonding with their kids and engaging in nurturing behavior compared to fathers. In other words, not only are women better at nurturing, but they're also more likely to enjoy spending time um, with infants and toddlers. And kids, I think, kind of intuit this, or they know this. 
Numerous studies indicate that infants and toddlers prefer their mothers to their fathers when they seek solace or relief from hunger, fear, sickness, or some other distress. For instance, one study done at Boston Children's Hospital found that infants relax when moms approach. They come like this. Their pulse, their breathing rate's lowered, their eyelids lowered. They, actually, this study also found that when dads approached in the same kind of experiment, the infants come like this. <laughs> so there was, there was a, kind of a distinct response to the way in which moms and dads, you know. And again, Ross Park, at the University of California, kind of talks about these dynamics playing out for, uh, for teenagers here um, in the United States. So what I would suggest to you this afternoon is that these kinds of advantages when it comes to things like breastfeeding, understanding, communicating, nurturing kids, help us to understand why kind of across the globe in very different cultural contexts, very different social structural contexts, very different religious and secular contexts, we do see kind of a human universal playing out with moms playing a particularly important role when it comes to the care, especially of infants um, and toddlers. Rutgers anthropologist Helen Fisher has said this, quote, in every culture in the world where anthropologists have looked, in 168 societies, even where women are exceedingly economically powerful, women do the vast majority of the raising of very small children. Women are interested in babies. They bear the babies. They've got the high levels of estrogen associated with the nurturing of the very young. We can see, of course, as we look, again, cross-culturally, in countries as different as Kenya, India, Mexico, the Philippines, Japan, the United States, that women tend to spend more time with their kids um, than, than do men. We can see here in the U.S., even when the mom is not the caretaker, it's usually the case that a woman is. And even probably in the most egalitarian country in the world, in, in Sweden, um, where they're really trying to encourage dads to do more when it comes to parental leave, we still see that moms are taking up sort of the lion's share of parental leave. Now, how does this matter then for, for kids? And I think it's because mom's sort of connection to their kids is um, more consistent compared to dads, I think we're kind of still learning more about um, sort of the sort of unique and distinctive effects of moms. But there are, I think, a couple of suggestive studies that are, that are helpful here in helping us to see how uh, moms who are more involved and are warmer with their kids are helping their kids to flourish. So one such study comes from the NICHD who's been tracking or has tracked um, kids who are in different types of child care um, from infancy um, over the course of their childhood years. What this NICHD study is suggesting is that kids who are spending a lot of time away from their mothers um, in those first few years of life are more likely to be struggling socially um, and behaviorally, as this slide here uh, suggests. And so the NICHD Early Child Care Research Network, which included diverse scholars from the left and the right, like Alison Clark Stewart and, and Jay Belsky, had kind of this finding when it came to looking at kids at age four and a half. Quote, the more time children spend in any of the variety of non-maternal care arrangements across the first 4.5 years of life, the more externalizing problems and conflict with adults they manifested at 54 months of age and in kindergarten, as reported by mothers, caregivers. So this is things like being more aggressive, being more defiant to caretakers, uh, teachers, um, and, and others. Now, it's important to note, of course, that this is a, a pretty contentious area of research. But I think when you look at kind of some of the leading lights in the field, uh, like Jane Wolfogel at, at Columbia University, um, who is no conservative by any stretch, what you do see, I think, is a recognition, at least that first year of life, from you know, zero to, to one, where taking a lot of time away from mom looks like it's more problematic um, on the social and emotional front uh, for kids. Then as you kind of look at kids at a different part of the life course, kind of at sort of their school age years, and then follow them into young adulthood, um, as Paul Amato at Penn State has done, what you see is that um, moms and dads um, both are influencing, it looks like, their kids, and things like you know, education, um, 
life satisfaction, distress, self-esteem. But moms, it looks like, are more important for what he calls the variation in outcomes for kinship ties, you know, within the family, if you will, including the extended family, and also for kind of their success in forging strong friendships um, into young adulthood. And so it's sort of the white bars in this particular figure where moms seem to be more influential um, than, than fathers. It's the black bars where dads are more important and sort of the bars on the right where they're both, um, both important in this research. So again, what Palomato is finding, he's the former chair of the American Sociological Association family section, is, quote, mothers account for a larger share of variance in kin ties and close friends than do fathers, but fathers and mothers account for roughly equal amounts of variance in life satisfaction. So I'm going to just kind of give you a sense of some of the research here um, that's directly related to um, mothers' effects or impacts on their um, children. So let me conclude by saying that I think this, this brief tour de force of the social science literature on gender and parenting would indicate the following. The best psychological, sociological, and biological evidence to date indicates that on average, men and women bring somewhat different gifts to the parenting enterprise. The children benefit from having parents with distinct parenting styles, and that the retreat from marriage has exacted, uh, sorry, exacted a particularly serious toll on the lives of uh, children from poor and working class communities across America. And again, the, the key caveat, of course, to these claims that I've made today is that there are obvious exceptions, and it's also the case that many kids turn out okay, um, even if they don't have an active and engaged mother or an active um, or engaged father. But again, on average, kids are more likely to flourish when they have um, an engaged mother and father uh, bringing their distinctive talents to the parenting enterprise. And I think there are really three takeaways here. Um, you know, given the nature of this conference, um, given our audience here today for uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, and the first takeaway is really kind of in the policy arena. I think the church has been and should continue to be a voice for families, um, for advocating public policies, such as paid parental leave um, and an expanded child tax credit that will allow parents, particularly in that first year of life, reasons that I mentioned just a few moments ago, to spend more time with their kids, to be more engaged in their children's lives. A second point is the church um, can and should, I think, do more to encourage younger adults to have kids in marriage and also to encourage married parents to do more to honor um, their wedding vows. You know, recognizing that today about 40% of kids are born outside of marriage and about 42% of first marriages end in divorce. So again, the church should be kind of a voice that's encouraging um, young adults um, and middle-aged adults to kind of keep marriage and parenthood um, connected, um, you know, on average, in the main. And the final thing that the church should be doing is to be um, accompanying, we've heard that word before, accompanying couples in crisis um, by preaching and teaching about the challenges of marriage and parenthood. You know, when you go to church on Sunday, you, you, people often are putting on their best, you know, clothes, or today not so much, but at least their best front, you know, um, for, for church or for mass. And you don't always sort of see the struggles, you know, lurking behind um, the scenes, maybe on a Saturday night um, over, you know, some kind of party, or maybe on a, a Wednesday evening over homework or something else. But obviously a lot of, a lot of parents, a lot of spouses... Um, are struggling um, in their marriages and with their kids. I think it would be helpful for both priests, pastors, rabbis, uh, lay leaders to do a lot more to articulate the challenging character of contemporary married life, the challenging character of contemporary parenthood in ways that would give people a sense that they're not in it alone, that their own struggles um, are probably actually not that uncommon, and that if nothing else, kind of knowing that other people are experiencing those difficulties can be a source of solace in the midst of uh, the trenches of marriage um, and parenthood today. So taking steps like these would increase, I think, the odds that children have the good fortune of growing up with the two persons whose love brought them into this world 
and the two people whose different experiences, perspectives, and talents as men and women enable them to make a unique gift of themselves to the ring of those children. As we have seen today, for the average child, nothing could be better than this opportunity to vivre la différence in their own home. Thank you.